welcome uh, everyone to the next 100. I'm Neil Fraser. I'm the president of Medtronic Canada. And uh, today I'm joined by two very eminent physicians in Canada. Uh, first, Dr. Catherine Smart, who is the president of the CMA and who is a pediatrician uh, practicing in Whitehorse in the Yukon. And secondly, Dr. Stuart Harris, um, who uh, is based in London, Ontario, and who is the current Diabetes Canada Chair in Diabetes Management, and who's an eminent researcher uh, on uh, diabetes uh, among different populations across Canada. I'd like to uh, kick things off um, and ask uh, each of our guests to talk about um, the health challenges and healthcare delivery challenges for remote Canadian locations? Sure, thanks for that question. I think it's a really important question as we look at this idea of universal health care and what that means for different Canadians. I think often in Canada, because we have a universal health care system, we have a false assumption that that means everyone has the same access to care. And I think there's unique challenges in rural and remote communities that have some parallels to more urban centres, but other aspects that are different. Uh, recruiting and retaining healthcare providers to rural and remote locations is challenging um, for many reasons. I think one of the biggest ones is because they're chronically often understaffed. The demands on people when they set up practice in rural and remote areas can be quite difficult to maintain. The access to supports is not the same. So, you know, if you have a, a complex patient or someone who needs specialized care, you don't always have that same access to those other colleagues in a rural and remote setting that you may have in a city. So that means a lot more burden of that care is on generalist providers. And that, of course, carries a certain amount of stress. The role is very broad. Uh, so you have to be a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none. Sometimes it feels as you need to really provide a full spectrum of care. Um, and in you know medicine, which is becoming increasingly complex, I think that is getting harder and harder to do. Um, so it's one of the exciting things about rural and remote practice, but it's also one of the challenges. I think as the rest of our system becomes increasingly stressed, being able to access those providers in other centers, and in our case in the Yukon, often out of territory, can be very challenging. And often your patients aren't the priority because you're not within the province uh, that you're trying to access. So sometimes you can run into limitations there. And I've experienced that where they say things like, well, we don't accept any referrals from outside of our own province which is challenging when you're in a territory and, and those specialists aren't where you are. And, and then, of course, your patient population is unique as well. And there's different challenges there, just even in physically accessing people. You know, here in the Yukon, we have many different rural communities. Uh, for most medical and healthcare providers are situated in Whitehorse. And the travel for folks that live outside of Whitehorse is substantial. Many of our communities, um, by road, it can be five hours to get to Whitehorse. And in the winter, that's a, a large ask to have someone come. There's also a lot of wonderful things about working in rural and remote places. I think the relationship you have with colleagues is very strong. You get to know each other and you have to count on each other. And, and that's certainly been my experience as a pediatrician in the Yukon. I've had many very, very sick children and I've never had everyone not show up when I've asked for help. So I think you get a sense of team and commitment to each other that's uh, very deep and appreciated. Um, and you get to know the people in your community. Often your patients are, you know, might be coaching your child in soccer, might be uh, your child's teacher. Um, and, and you just run into people and get to know people in a different way. So I think that creates different relationships that are often very fulfilling. So I think there's lots of challenges, but I also think there's lots of rewards. Um, but I think it's something that we need to be considering when we're thinking about the health system is how do we account for the differences of what it takes to deliver health care in a rural and remote location compared to an urban setting? Dr. Harris, now you've, um, you've been at the forefront of new technological innovations in your um, review of practice guidelines for diabetes, but uh, uh, you know, that doesn't preclude other kinds of innovations that, that you've been able to apply um, do, you, do you want to uh, chip in and, and give your thoughts? I'm most proud of, of what we do here in London is within our clinic. And, and I think we are a model of team-based care. Now, lots of uh, uh, provinces and jurisdictions have implemented team-based care. 
but not really evaluated uh, whether or not it's working and what works and what doesn't work. Um, very expensive to pay for team-based care when you're bringing on lots of people on salary. But in fact, if you can accomplish that, the efficiencies and the wraparound care and the continuity that, uh, that, that uh, go to benefit the patients are, are fantastic. So in, in our team-based model, we have an allied healthcare team that includes nurse practitioners, a social support worker who's essential to kind of bridge all of the gaps and the paperwork to get people coverage or, or what, what have you. We have diabetes nurse educators and, and dietitians. And the role of the physician is actually the least important. We kind of, in my clinic, I don't have any patients booked in my day. I have, I see 30 or 40 patients, but they're shared across the team. And so the continuity and access is is much broader and um so i um, i discuss the uh the case management decisions at the end of the clinical interview but we're able to take care of such a larger group of patients and do that wraparound care and so the the my role is really to support you know what i think is a fantastic team but i think that we've really succeeded here in the primary care diabetes support program which is what we're called uh, to uh, to be able to provide ac- uh, that wraparound care, reduce the barriers, and um, ensure that the patient gets empowered and treated. And because we don't require referral, et cetera, we have a much broader um, uh, a group of patients. So our innovation is application in excellence, I think, of the team-based model. One of the things that, that of course, happened during the pandemic was we went from uh, single digit uh, utilization of virtual services and and virtual services, there's a whole spectrum, as you know, it could be just using a telephone uh, all the way to monitoring physiologic variables and just thinking about virtual services, uh, how do you see those fitting into, uh, you know, the the, uh, the team's model that both of you have discussed and, and uh, what, what have your experiences been with uh, technologies now being available? The, the shift to virtual care or just the adoption of virtual care has been really powerful. I, I think there's still absolutely aspects of it that need to be sorted out. It, 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 virtual care definitely can be a risk for more high volume, low quality care, and, and that's not what we want it to be. Uh, but it can be a very powerful tool to improve longitudinal care and access to care, I think, when used well. Um, and I also think it can really help make the care more patient-centered and, again, not put burdens on patients to have to come to the office for sometimes simple things that could have been addressed over a phone call or a quick you know, video conference um, and, and be much more efficient use of the patient's time as well as the healthcare provider. I think it does, again, allow more team-based care because it's often, you know, much more efficient to get everyone together on a call like this and have to physically bring everyone to the same location. So I, I think now that everyone's comfort level with using virtual care and just even virtual tools is improved, there's lots of things there that can be really leveraged to the advantage of our patients. The other thing I think has been really helpful for us, especially, again, being in a rural and remote location is the ability to improve people's access to specialists. So when we're talking about diabetes care, one of the other programs we've started here is bringing the pediatric diabetes team to the Yukon uh, to see our patients with type 1 diabetes uh, twice a year in person here in, in collaboration with us in our pediatric clinic. But of course, with the pandemic, that ability for them to travel here was impacted But what we were able to do was still create that same experience for patients by doing that over Zoom. And I really appreciated that because we had the expertise of the team from Vancouver on the Zoom call, but I would still join as the local pediatrician. Um, And again, it really improved communication. Now we're all on the call with the family and the child. We're all hearing the same thing. We're answering the questions. And sometimes other issues come up uh, that need my expertise as the general pediatrician that then I'm able to address at the same time for that family. You know, again, linking back to what we first talked about, so much of what's challenging being in a rural place is not having that same access always to people to support you. So when your colleagues are able to come in and support you like that, so you feel like the care you're delivering is excellent for your patients, that also really helps helps you as the provider. 
and and it improves your own ability to learn new things and to keep your medical knowledge high when you can access that specialized care and, and be part of that delivery to your patients. So I think there's so many ways that we can leverage virtual care in those ways going forward that are, are going to have multiple benefits. And, and what about um, real time versus, you know, offline or asynchronous uh, uh, mm-hmm. care? Because uh, that's the other thing is that, that with virtual care, you're, you know, you may be dependent on the availability of colleagues at a specific time when they are not available or it's the middle of the night or, or whatever. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, for sure. I think that's really important. And and I can tell you, I have a lot of patients that have my email and email me about different things. And I do a lot of asynchronous communication with other experts involved in their care and sometimes with families directly. And and in my case, I also do a lot of work with community partners or even things because I, I care for many children who have a First Nations background. I also do a lot of letter writing to Jordan's principal to allow them to access those services. And that's all asynchronous. That's all outside of regular office hours. But it's all important. Um, so I do, th- again, think when those things can fit into the bundle of care that you provide, it's much easier than having to, you know, every time you email someone or talk to someone for five minutes, having to go into your EMR and bill for it. Uh, it's very cumbersome, that way of doing things, I think. Um, and I do think there's going to be more asynchronous communication in the future. And I think, you know, it, it is can be a very efficient way for many people to weigh in on a problem over a group email or uh, different functions like that. So I, I think we need to keep an open mind really about what care is and what care looks like. I totally agree. I think those are those are really great comments. And um, so the I think moving forward, the challenge will be for, <laughs> and we've been faced with this for so long, to do things differently, to have different payment funding models, to have, like, take advantage of what we've learned by being forced to shift the way we deliver care. There are lots of challenges and catch-up that we need to do, especially in terms of accessing specialty care and surgical care, et cetera, et cetera. But the model's broken. In the, in the mid-60s, when Medicare came into existence in Canada, there was lots of money in the healthcare system. Nobody kind of worried about what it costed. But, you know, COVID has really shown us, and, and the burgeoning chronic disease challenges over the last 20, 30 years has really shown us that, in fact, you know, this, this model is just not working in, in the, way, the way hospitals are funded, the way physicians are funded. Um, it, you just can't try and continue to restrict access as your strategy to control costs, which is what we have. So, you know, perhaps, you know, there'll be new discussions as the provinces line up with the feds to ask for more, mo- for more money, of course. But on how innovation can happen, again, that word, around delivery of care and the way it's funded. Uh, we, we, we definitely need a fix. Uh, we've got lots of great ideas and experience. Virtual care is part of it. Asynchronous care, I agree, is going to have a, a, a much larger role. Was very, lots of physicians did email uh, uh, contact as virtual care with their patients. So I think there's a huge opportunity that we're looking at right now it's whether or not we can get the buy-in, I think, at the government level to take advantage of looking at things differently because we were forced to because of COVID. Dr. Smart, is the CMA uh, looking at these issues? And, uh, you know, I, I realize you're, you're sort of an advisory group to the provincial medical associations, but uh, what sort of, how do you weigh in on these issues as a national body? For sure. Well, certainly virtual care is something that the CMA has been actively involved in, and it actually had started a virtual care task force to really look at how to optimize utilization of virtual care prior to the pandemic. So it was quite timely in that some of that work had, was already happening. Um, so I think that's definitely an area that we've been vocal in. You know, I, I think our work with the federal government, what we're really trying to advance is this idea that we need to reimagine the healthcare system and we need to advance things like integrated team-based care as the way forward. We need the federal government to provide some leadership and some targeted investment to, to really, you know, I guess, try to encourage these best practices recognizing that some of these issues are, have gotten beyond really what an individual jurisdiction can solve itself. 
one of the big challenges in Canada is because in some ways our healthcare system is like that sacred cow that no one really wants to disrupt because there's like this fear if we somehow open Pandora's box, something terrible is going to happen. And because we sort of hold it as a national treasure, we're afraid to admit that it's not working. I feel like now perhaps we can no longer do that. I think it's very clear with where we find ourselves right now. The system is it's arguably collapsing across the country um, and we can no longer just pretend because it's important to us that what we have is good enough. Dr. Harris, um, as it, getting back to the theme of the next 100, um, you know, what would you like to see in the next 100 years in terms of innovations in the way that healthcare is delivered and, and perhaps enabling technologies if, if that makes sense? Mm-hmm. It's remarkable how far we've come in, in a very short period of time. So we're already starting to see the next 100 uh, examples of it. And again, if you'll allow me, I'll just use, because I can, we can talk about many different kind of diseases, et cetera, but um, we've talked about integration of virtual care. Uh, we've, we have technologies now that will empower patients uh, uh, how to better self-manage themselves and be better aware of what... Uh, how to live their lives to be as healthy as possible. Um, we, the explosion in new treatments, whether it's for oncology treatments or in diabetes, you know, we have, we have G- GLP-1 receptor agonists that are like remarkable drugs. We are moving into a new era of true obesity treatments that are non-bariatric but have the same benefits with the pipelines of new therapies coming down the line. Um, it's, it's assuring access because these aren't cheap. Uh, but we are on the cusp of seeing, you know, changes in the trajectories of our chronic diseases, like in reduction in, ca- in deaths due to cardiovascular disease, reduction in deaths, even though as the prevalence increases because we live longer, etc. But, you know, tackling the root causes through therapies and technology especially empowering uh, uh, patients, uh, whether it's obesity risk reduction um, or technologies that uh, will replace like artificial pancreases, for example. I mean, that's happening now. That's not the next 100. That's the next 5 to 10 uh, from from now where type 1 di- and stem cell research, you know, when that really comes to... Uh, the access and availability and the, uh, the markability uh, on a mass scale of, of stem cell research. We're talking about cure, cure, curative therapies for everything, for autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes, for cancers, for organ replacement. I mean, it's, uh, that's the next 100. It's, and, and robotics that, you know, we're going to, we're going to have robotics as part of uh, healthcare and uh, and helping people live healthy, normal lives. So, very exciting time. I mean, I, I I think we really need to, you know, us as educators and healthcare providers have to ensure that the 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 next generation of trainees gets excited about this stuff rather than being intimidated or think that it, they don't have access to it because it hasn't been their traditional training. But how to integrate the the new generations of of healthcare providers uh, and and the opportunity and potential? That's part of the next 100. Thank you so much for joining us on the next 100, uh, Dr. Smart and Dr. Harris. Thank you.